Welcome to Mutual Aid, Building Communities of Care During Crisis and Beyond. Um, thank you to all the people that are tuning in. It seems like there was, you know, over a thousand people listening. So that's incredible to all the people who are here to support. So far, we've raised over $3,000 for, <clears throat> for the various causes that we've been here to talk about. Um, and yeah, so, you know, today we are here on, I'm here on Wabanaki land, um, but no matter where you are listening to this land, where, wherever you are listening to this or watching this, um, we are all on stolen indigenous land and uh, recognize and respect the indigenous peoples of North America as the stewards of, <coughs> of this land. So um, this is a free talk, but although this is a free talk, we will be asking for donations. You may have donated through Haymarket when you signed up for the event. Thank you if you have Haymarket. Um, and if you came up via YouTube, Twitter, or other means, you can donate via Venmo to at PM underscore press. Whatever does come in will be split up five ways and donated to the five groups identified by the participants. <coughs> Those groups are MAP for Youth, La Resistencia, La Resistencia, Cooperation Jackson, Indigenous Mutual Aid, Indigenous Mutual Aid in the Presente, Maine. Um, I can talk a little bit about these groups. MAP for Youth moves resources to build youth leadership. Last year, MAP for Youth helped spark 14 mutual aid projects led by young people ages 12 to 29. We are blown away by the power they have built and the resources that they have moved. La, Resist La Resistencia is a grassroots organization based in Washington state, working to end the detention of immigrants and stop deportations. For five plus years, we have fought to close the Northwest Detention Center, and we will not stop until all the doors are opened and everyone is free. <clears throat> Cooperation Jackson is an emerging vehicle for sustainable community development, economic democracy, and community ownership. Their long-term vision is to develop a cooperative network based in Jackson, Mississippi, that will consist of four interconnected and interdependent institutions, a federation of local worker cooperatives, a cooperative incubator, a cooperative educational and training center, the Kwasi Balagoon Center for Economic Democracy and Development, and a cooperative bank or financial institution. <clears throat> Indigenous Mutual Aid is an information and support network with an anti-colonial and anti-capitalist framework. We exist to inspire and empower autonomous indigenous relief organizing in response to COVID-19. <clears throat> Presente Maine targets the empowerment and the integration of the Latino community in Maine through education, community, organizing, civic engagement, and direct support and services. In the wake of coronavirus, they've been serving thousands of meals to anyone who needs them. So, um, yeah, so again, it's really incredible to have all these people together on, on one uh, Zoom call. And uh, yeah, looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say. So I guess to get started, um, we will hear from, we're gonna hear in the beginning from each of, um, the participants and they're going to be talking about their ideas on mutual aid the sort of organizing they're doing and um just their thoughts on the subject and then throughout the conversation you'll be able to send us questions via whatever platform you're using to tune into this and we'll be screening those questions and hopefully passing them on to our lovely guests so uh <clears throat> i guess let's Kick it off with uh, Klee. Klee Benali, how are you doing today? Could be better. <laughs> well, sorry. It's a complicated question these days. <laughs> I know, I know. So, uh, yeah, talk about talk about your work. Talk about your ideas about mutual aid. Yatia te hasin flo, she i Klee dasha jine, tori chi ni shabashas chi na kredina e dasha nela, shuma e beitha chi i aro, beitha chi i dasha che, zithi jin de na sha aro, kinthana shiha wan. My name is Kali Benali. I'm originally from Black Mesa on the Diné or Navajo Nation. And currently I reside here in Kinthlene or so-called Flagstaff at the base of uh, the Koosli, one of our holy mountains for Diné people. Um, so yeah, since uh, 2007, I've been organizing with a group uh, out of Tullahoan Info Shop. We established this space and it has sort of evolved into from like the typical info shop 
projects that was primarily established in response to like this sort of white dominated anarchist cultures of info shops as a radical, radical anti-colonial, anti-capitalist space. Um, and we've been organizing a range of different mutual aid projects out of there over the years, direct action projects as well. And it's evolved into a direct action resource center and more or less um, what we consider conflict infrastructure. And so we just have like reoriented towards different conflicts and sort of precipitated conflicts in our area as much as we, we can uh, to intervene and disrupt in uh, environmental and social issues that we're facing as indigenous folks. And so um, we transitioned immediately um, as the threat of COVID-19 uh, was right at our doorstep, especially because we've had um, years and years of organizing with unsheltered indigenous relatives on the street. Um, and so we recognized that they were extremely vulnerable. We wanted to make sure that, especially considering the lack of infrastructure and limited resources available for them, that um, we were doing everything that we could uh, to support uh, their, uh, their health, well-being, um, and get them out of a crowded shelter that was uh, basically abusive and discriminatory against them. Um, so we initiated a project back on May 14th called uh, Kinfana Mutual Aid, um, which is sort of the typical standard models and frameworks that most folks are using. We um, drew upon some of the work that um, my buddy Taylor Hall from DC Mutual Aid was uh, using, where they have like a hub storage facility and then a delivery system, all fairly decentralized and then like, you know, sort of built out from there. Um, and we started initially just focusing on Kinflana in the immediate area, but recognized really quickly that we needed to spread throughout the region um, based upon some of the needs and the threats impacting the Diné and Hopi communities and other indigenous nations throughout the area. Um, I also um, am partner with a group called uh, Navajo and Hopi Families COVID-19 Relief Fund and Effort, which was started by uh, my relative Ethel Branch. She is a former attorney general of the Navajo Nation, um, but she recognized that there's this huge threat uh, potentially facing our communities considering um, the disparities that exist in our reservation communities. Uh, the Navajo Nation has about anywhere from 200,000 to 300,000 members living on the res. Um, we have the largest land-based reservation in the so-called U.S. with a land base about the size of West Virginia, um, yet we only have about 13 grocery stores that um, provide for that population. We also have like a limited number of hospitals that are substandard because they're uh, Indian Health Service clinics, IHS, um, and about 30% of um, our residents on our lands, both Hopi and Diné, um, don't have access to running water and don't have um, uh, electricity as well. And so um, a lot of uh, remote communities that don't have access to internet as well. Um, so this is a serious challenge and potential a uh, very vulnerable um, population. And as we see today at this moment, Deneta or the, the Navajo Nation has the highest rate per capita of COVID-19 um, in comparison to any settler colonial US state. Uh, that means we have about, according to the last information that we have, uh, 4,253 confirmed cases and 146 deaths. Um, and so it's really present and, and, and really something that we're all suffering through because of our clan system and our interconnectedness with our families. Um, and so I also um, helped to form another group called Indigenous Mutual Aid, which is the network that um, Y'all mentioned we have about 20 organizations that are now part of that and we're growing um, and we're specifically um, uh, reaching out to raise funds for an emer emergency fund sp to get into the hands of folks on the front lines, people who are, are not even formally organized. They're just doing amazing work on the front lines. Uh, we have one person who is just driving around the reservations and distributing masks. Um, and she's distributed thousands and thousands of masks. And so this is sort of like the scope and scale of what we've been doing. And we are continuing to build, we're building our infrastructure because uh, as much of uh, this virus is, is being the crisis, we recognize that um, we've always faced a crisis of capitalism and colonialism. And in times of these disasters, these um, crises become magnified. And so our response um, is one that we are working to meet that on a systemic level. Um, so we have, you know, and one of the challenges that we face too is, is that a lot of people are aware of the impacts on a Navajo nation. Um, and so there's just this 
overwhelming amount of victimization of our people, um, even though we are survivors. This isn't the first virus that our people have faced. Uh, we have our medicines, our ceremonies, our cultural teachings and our ways of life, but we have faced attacks. It's not, you know, we don't have a food desert. Um, if people look and they say, oh, you know, these are poor indigenous folks because they don't have electricity, they don't have running water, they don't have all these grocery stores. Oh, well, it, it's actually, <laughs> um, our people were subsistent. Uh, we, we were um, self-determining before colonialism. Food, food deserts didn't exist before colonialism um, in our lands. And so the reality is, is, is that starvation was weaponized against our people. Uh, there were scorch earth campaigns waged by invaders um, that decimated our livestock, our fields, and um, created dependency um, after um, our, uh, this attack on our food sovereignty occurred. And so um, the, they, they set up rations at forts so we'd be, become dependent upon that. Or missions, Christian missions would come in and um, uh, give rations and we would, so our people would become dependent upon that. And so um, this, this sort of what we see as a food desert today has a context, a brutal context um, that has stripped, you know, it's not an accident, it's by design that our uh, autonomy, our ability to feed our um, communities has been attacked. Uh, and so, um, the, you know, what we're seeing now is this sort of victimization of our people and um, these charity groups rushing in, even some that are calling themselves mutual aid at this point, rushing in and perpetuating the same dynamics. They're basically, these nonprofit organizations are the new forts giving out rations rather than looking at ways we can empower our communities, build up the support so that way we can um, organize to the point where um, uh, uh, the systems, because th this the system failed us a long time ago, but it wasn't designed to serve us in the first place. Um, and so it's basically what we're looking at is empowering our capacity and looking at projects that are more exciting, creative, um, and finding ways um, that are built along the understanding that our cultures, um, our cultural teachings, our ceremonies, our medicines, our spiritual understandings in, in connection to our, our mother, the earth, because um, is, is, is the first framework we have for action and mutual aid. Because mutual aid isn't something that was created by Kropotkin, and he acknowledges that in his book, um, uh, even though there's a lot of fucked up language and a range of other things, you know, that exist in that book, um, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution. Um, the reality is, is that he studied and acknowledged that mutual aid is a law of nature. And we understand that as indigenous people because we embody that and that has not been broken um, through through many cycles of, of colonialism, we have still maintained that through our traditional teachings. And so um, we are working to restore that and amplify that in the formations of mutual aid that we have in spite of the failures of the, these government systems. So we can organize um, uh, to, in, to intervene and make sure that capitalism and colonialism don't recuperate themselves uh, through this crisis, but also to make them irrelevant uh, through this whole process. And so this is um, part of uh, our formation and the, the the approach that we have. But right now what we see is a lot of co-optation, a lot of victimization, and a lot of this sort of like parading around of, of solidarity, not charity. And this is sort of why we're saying actually it's solidarity and and ceremony, not charity for indigenous folks. Um, and that an indigenous mutual aid is necessary because if, if a settler colonial uh, mutual aid is possible, an indigenous mutual aid is extremely necessary. You know, Klee, thank you for saying all that. Very, very interesting to hear how, um, you know, like taking the shift from like a subcultural being trapped in, in a subcultural sort of scene and stepping out and generalizing these practices. I love hearing about, you know, just the normal small A anarchism or whatever of people just going out and delivering masks just a guy in a truck car just going around distributing stuff y'all are doing incredible work and uh, you know i appreciate what you had to say about peter kropotkin not inventing mutual aid and you know <laughs> drawing on all that history um so thank you clee um next we will be hearing from uh, dean spade dean spade has spent over two decades in social movements working to end prisons borders poverty and war and support people trying to survive right now 
In 2017, he started the website BigDoorBrigade.com to help people start and sustain mutual aid projects and to circulate popular education materials about the role of mutual aid in transformative movements. He is currently working on a book about mutual aid for Verso Press. Dean is the author of Normal Life, Administrative Violence, Critical Trans Politics, and The Limits of Law, available via Duke University Press. Dean, how are you, how so are you today? Friend. I'm good. I'm so glad to be here. It's such an immense honor to be part of an event with these particular people whose work I study and um, value and learn so much from. And I'm grateful to the organizers of this event. Um, I am calling in from Duwamish land and also known as Seattle, Washington. Um, and I thought maybe it'd be useful just to talk a little bit about that project, Big, Do Big Door Brigade, and why it emerged. Um, it came out of my frustration um, w watching like during a period when Trump was elected, how there was a lot of, I thought like newly mobilizable, angry and scared people. Um, but there is this th th sort of stories we hear about social change in the US really like undermine our ability to actually turn that into mobilization. So instead we get a lot of demobilizing moves like you're just supposed to donate to a nonprofit or you're just supposed to wait to vote or you're just supposed to um, like hope that your representatives in government will do something. Um, we're supposed to hope that the ACLU will sue and the courts will fix it. And, and that's about kind of a narration of social movements that erases the, the fundamental power of people power and the specific role that mutual aid has as the way people enter movements, as the on-ramp movements. People often come into movements because they're having a problem and they need something and they are joining others who have an analysis about how this problem was made not by us, but by the system or they want to help other people who've been through something they've been through or they're mad, you know, some situation they're mad about. Like that's how movements really grow. And we really need our movements to grow and we really need mobilization if we're going to win anything because, you know, the other side has all the money and the guns and what we have is people. Um, and, and so mutual aid projects are often also places where people build greater solidarity than they had when they came in. So a lot of times we come in because we're upset about one thing, we get there and we get to work with each other and learn that more complexity about the problem. There's intra-group difference in our groups and we learn about parts of it where we had, we were not aware of harm that um, was happening or we had misunderstandings about people in our own communities. And so it's a real place where people can get kind of mobilized but also politicized. And that's a really significant piece especially because of, I think this uh, relates a lot to what Cleo was saying, because we live in the context of a long-term charity model narrative where people have basically been told, like, I mean, I think in today's world, it looks like nonprofits and it looks like, you know, there's these elites and they're gonna like solve our problems through a nonprofit or they're gonna get win a lawsuit or get a law through Congress or through your state legislature. And so there's this kind of passivity, like we're all supposed to sit around and wait for elites to deliver solutions instead of what we really want, which is collective self-determination, where people actually determine things about their own workplaces, about you know, the, the spaces they live in, about um, childcare, healthcare, energy, you know, all the things. We want that kind of collective self-determination, and instead we get to practice passivity and hoping somebody else will deliver the answer. So mutual aid is really the alternative to that, and that's part of why I think it's not narrated in the stories, the, the lies about social change that we're told um, you know, in elementary school or whatever. Um, and also I think it's often not narrated because it's mostly done by women, people of color, indigenous people. And so it's like, it's like the kind of, like in general, I would say a lot of mutual aid work is the women's work of our movements because it's care work. It's work about actually like making sure people are okay. And so that in, in our, in a, a capitalist in a society, in a white supremacist society, that's not valued. It's all about like the external deliverables and not like actually how are people doing, are people surviving? So I think there's lots of reasons it's been kind of written out of the picture. So the Big Door Brigade website was just an effort to like lift up mutual aid as a strategy. Now there are many more bigger things because mutual aid is having a moment. <laughs> um, but that was what the goal of that um, website was to just show like mutual aid, obviously we see it really visibly in these disaster moments, these like acute disasters, but mutual aid is going on all the time as people are confronting and trying to survive the disasters of capitalism and colonialism and white supremacy. Um, the, the question that I think would be interesting for us, to, one of the sort of questions that I'm really chewing on right now that I'd be interested in all of us talking and thinking about is, I think there's a lot of mobilization happening right now. There's like this possibility that the level of um, frustration people are having, the crises people are in around the economy and, and the virus itself and um, people's family members being trapped in prisons that are COVID death traps and all of these things we're experiencing, they can potentially lead to mobilization and to bolder and bolder tactics where we win more and more. 
But I think there's a real question about like, we can't assume that'll happen, right? Like the question is, can we build sustainable mutual aid organizations? Can they be networked in meaningful ways? Can they stand up for each other? And can we stand up for each other as people use bold tactics to fight the systems, whether that's labor strikes or rent strikes or, or you know, all the different kinds of, um, you know, try helping people get out of prison in other ways, whatever it is. Um, how are we going to kind of build those? And some of the questions that I've been thinking about a lot and trying to support different organizations on recently is like how to build really positive and strong organizational cultures that keep people and are welcoming to people, um, how to build decision-making structures in our organizations that really let everybody be heard and, and mobilize people to have more capacity to govern their own lives and communities as we move forward, um, how to deal with conflict that is inevitable in our uh, movement organizations. I think most people I know who identify as being burned out conflict has a lot to do with it. So what can, how can we, and obviously Miriam is like a huge leader in thinking about this in so many contexts, but how do we think about conflict differently and move towards conflict prevention and meeting conflict to make it generative instead of having our orgs fall apart and we lose people um, when there's conflict. Um, I think the last thing I'll say is I think, you know, most of us um, can't have spent our lives in deeply hierarchical, really, um, uh, you know, non-democratic uh, organizations, schools, families, churches, whatever, you know, gover under governments, where we have no say in what happens in our lives. So we don't have a lot of skills about how to do that together. And so in mutual aid projects, we get to find, practice that, like we get to actually practice making decisions together, showing up for each other, trying to hear everybody. Um, and that's really like, not something we're used to, giving and receiving feedback. Um, so I think that that's like some of the cutting, that stuff sounds like some people think so internal and processy, but actually I think that's like, going to make or break whether or not our mobilizations have the capacity to last and make and, and win and win more than we've won in a long time. I love it. That's uh, it's, it's so great to focus on the sort of emotional, but also the, the infrastructural organizational stuff, because we often, when we hear about mutual aid, we're often hearing, hearing about it, like happening off somewhere and it's just a magical process. So it's good for people to you know, to think about all that stuff. So thank you for, thank you. Um, next, uh, we will have Kali Akuno. Kali Akuno is a co-founder and co-director of Cooperation Jackson. Kali served as the director of special projects and external funding in the mayoral administration of the late Chakwe Lumumba of Jackson. His focus in the role was supporting cooperative development, the introduction of eco-friendly and carbon reduction methods of operation, and the promotion of human rights and international relations for the city. Kelly also served as the co-director of the U.S. Human Rights Network, the executive director of the People's Hurricane Relief Fund, based in New Orleans, Louisiana, after Hurricane Katrina, and was a co-founder of the School of Social Justice and Community Development, a public school serving the academic needs of low-income African-American and Latino communities in Oakland, California. Kelly, uh, how, are, how are you doing? Uh, as we say around here, I'm black and breathing, brother. Um, and those are two good things. <laughs> um, well, greetings, everybody. Um, you know, um, here in what we call uh, Mega Eversville, uh, as you all know, um, this city was named after uh, Andrew Jackson, whose name I don't even like invoking. Uh, and, and his particular role. And everyone should note that uh, who Trump is uh, modeling his presidency off of is uh, the one Andrew Jackson. When he put that picture of Mr. Jackson uh, up behind himself uh, in the so-called over office, I think they should have told us all we really needed to know. Uh, it should have been some clear marching uh, orders. Um, but uh, I mean, um, you know, the settler colonial state known as Mississippi, which is, uh, Choctaw land. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, uh, both Clee and Dean, I think, really laid out kind of some of the politics around how we would define mutual aid. So I'll just speak a little bit more about um, our kind of immediate response, uh, some of our history, um, and, you know, how we see some things uh, going forward. Um, Dean um, raised a lot of the questions that I was going to try to raise 
a bit later uh, as we have been trying to endeavor uh, as part of our kind of response to initiate um, this people strike initiative and movement uh, to really kind of up the ante in a lot of ways. Uh, but on the, on the immediate and local level, one critical thing uh, for us uh, is that our project was really born uh, out of kind of the growing pains of Hurricane Katrina. And, and folks should, should know that. So it's, it's the accumulation of some hard lessons that were learned 15 years ago, uh, compounded by all the, you know, centuries of um, brutal exploitation, you know, degradation that our people have suffered, you know, particularly down here in the, in the deep parts of what's called the South. Um, but, but that particular experience, um, I think really was a, a wake up call in a number of, of different ways of uh, how even with a certain level of uh, representation within the bourgeois institutions, you know, in, in Louisiana and Mississippi in particular, there's a lot of black politicians that have been around and part of the state legislatures and city governments for a while and how they were totally inadequate to kind of meet the situation 15 years ago. Um, and we were kind of determined, I think a small crew of us, you know, who, who've kind of constituted a loose core uh, of organizers and activists, some uh, in the same political organizations, but many not spread throughout a number of different organizations. Uh, really internalized that and tried to build a program that uh, we kind of somewhat encapsulated in what we call the Jackson Cush program, but particularly the dimensions of how we wanted to build cooperation in Jackson, that experience was fundamental to it. Uh, and we tried to make sure from uh, the jump um, that we could be in a prime position during the next crisis, because number one, the capitalist system breeds these periodically. Uh, but also, uh, one of the key things that, that we were kind of really woke up to in a, in a, in a very brutal fashion was uh, that climate change wasn't something that was coming in the future. It was here, and it was going to have an impact directly on our people. It's something that we kind of woke up to, you know, in a, in a stark way during that time. Uh, so as such, you know, we've really tried to build uh, our program uh, around food sovereignty, uh, around uh, really trying to, to a degree, what we call make visible the what's, what's you know, there existing. Uh, it's our position in line that uh, the solidarity economy of mutual aids are not something that anybody invented. They're very much organic to our people's uh, lives as social beings. We are more nurtured to share than we are to struggle and fight uh, with each other. Um, and that that is something that we had to harness on. So our particular role in that regard, we've always felt in cooperation Jackson was to extend that uh, to various degrees beyond the competitive kind of dynamics that we've all been socialized with in this culture um, and to, to move the sharing and exchange beyond kind of kinship groups, which is where it's most practiced in, the, in a place like Jackson, uh, but to extend that to, to broader relations with folks that you may not know um, folks that you may not even like, but who are sharing some of the same issues and struggles that you are uh, in terms of totally inadequate housing, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, polluted soils, polluted lands, uh, lack of jobs, lack of job access, um, you name it. You know, uh, we, we struggle with it here in, uh, in this city and have for generations. But people have, have on their own, you know, organize different ways to not only survive, but at times thrive uh, and to build, you know, uh, fulfilling lives, not without its challenges, not without its struggles. Uh, but we always want to highlight that. Uh, and we think it's, it's if there's one thing that, the kind of in a general sense, you could say about uh, the experience of, of people of African descent, you know, uh, in, in, what's called the United States or, or the Western Hemisphere uh, is how we've been able to take a little bit of nothing and turn it into some beautiful things. Uh, and that's a, a core piece of what we try to bring to our work and to our dynamic, uh, really drawing on some of our own theoreticians like Amnikar Cabral, who've always accentuated that culture really is the lifeblood of a revolution uh, and that it grows from really uh, building on uh, uh, the culture of the people and, and taking the democratic elements of that, highlighting that, strengthening that, going deeper in the transformation of that. 
And that's something we've tried to put in practice here. Um, so in the midst of, um, uh, well, one thing I should know, let me back up because this is more of a personal piece. You know, we jumped on um, a small crew of us. I'm not going to say everybody in our crew, but a small crew of us who had been through Hurricane Katrina. We also lost uh, uh, several comrades very close to us, both in New Orleans and in Oakland, California, to H1N1. So we already also had a, some heads up around how, how serious, uh, you know, these kind of new novel threats uh, can be and really start engaging, you know, in a lot of black dialogue spaces, you know, um, trying to counter a lot of false notions that were being put out there that black people couldn't catch the coronavirus is one of these conspiracy theories that was floating around pretty heavily in January and February. Um, you know, and things like that. So we would sort of say, based on our own experience, no, look, this is real, take it seriously and start getting prepared. Uh, and we were saying very early on, given how the United States is structured that once it got here, we knew automatically who that was going to impact. It was going to be black people, it was going to be Latinos, it was going to be indigenous people. That was, you know, you could predict that, unfortunately. Uh, and it just played itself out. Uh, and we were trying to give folks fair warning ahead of time that if and when the disease, the, the, the virus gets pegged in that way, we have to draw upon another set of history, which is also very deep in our community, is how the AIDS and HIV crisis was treated and just left, you know, millions of our family members basically to die with no research, no public intervention, and really nobody giving a shit. So we tried to draw again on, on that knowledge of saying that we, we see this coming and this is ultimately how this is going to be treated because we are deemed to be utterly disposable to this system. So if we don't take it upon ourselves to save ourselves, to liberate ourselves, nobody else, there's nobody coming to save us. And that's the ground by which we try to stand upon and operate. You know, and in that vein, the initial things that we tried to do, uh, you know, we shut most of our operations down basically in, in, uh, in the end of February like real quickly once we kind of got some wind um, anecdotally from where we live in, in you know, in, in the western part of the city, uh, that many of our homeless family uh, and membership, you know, were, were getting ill uh, and several had died. This was the, big, the end of February here uh, where we're at. And that just started to escalate. So we quickly shut things down and try to shift gears. And the first thing we wanted to do was take, you know, the basic surplus that we had been producing on our, on, on our farm and start distributing that. Uh, but we quickly kind of shut some of that down because we learned from comrades in Italy in particular that if we didn't have the proper protective equipment, this is not how we would do our normal mutual aid endeavors. And, and they got real sick and we didn't want to, you know, to make our people make them subject to that because about half of my membership has some form of pre-existing condition, be it diabetes, uh, asthma, uh, uh, some, some heart conditions. So we shut that down and then re re pivoted. And the first thing that we really wound up doing uh, was taking the limited resources that we had as an expertise and started making masks, right? So that we can distribute those to the community as a first line of protection and doing education with that. You know, and that's what we stepped into. Uh, and from seeing the kind of general response, that's what really led us to kind of take on a broader dynamic and to really call for what we thought it was needed, needed given the overall political situation. Uh, was to call for a move towards a general strike in this empire uh, to really shift the balance of power and put it directly in our hands. So, you know, we can speak more to that, but I'll, I'll leave it there uh, uh, for now so others can build. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, personally, I really enjoyed studying Cooperation Jackson, your writings, and uh, it's really uh, amazing to hear, hear from all of you today. Um, I thought it was really interesting to hear about how you talked about um, like the cultural connections or the, uh, you know, the personal connections made in Katrina and how that formed a core that eventually enabled y'all to like have a, an, an amazing dream, like um, cooperation Jackson and, and execute it. And, uh, and it's, and it's, and, it, and it's, an, I mean, another thing I'm sure we're going to talk about is like the failures of the state to act obviously, but it's like seeing y'all making, um, masks while they're saying oh you don't need one it's like you know i was wearing a mask <laughs> around that time it's uh it, it was pretty obvious at the time that masks were going to be helpful 
um, and while they were telling us not to wear them. Um, well, thank you so much. Um, next, we will be hearing from Miriam Kaba. Miriam Kaba is an educator and organizer based in New York City. She has been active in anti-criminalization and anti-violence movements for over 30 years. Miriam is the founder and director of Project NIA, a grassroots or abolitionist organization with a vision to end youth incarceration. She is also the co-founder of Survived and Punished, a grassroots group focusing on on free and criminalized survivors of domestic and sexual violence from jails, prisons, and detention centers through mutual aid, organizing, and police advocacy. She is the author of Missing Daddy, available via haymarketbooks.org. And I uh, just want to remind all the audience members, if you have questions, um, please feel free to drop them in the, however you're uh, attending and viewing this event, and uh, we will try to get to them as we as we get to it. Um, Miriam, can you hear me? I can, yes. H how are you today? I'm, I'm hanging in. Thank you so much. Um, glad to be here tonight and um, Ramadan Mubarak to all who observe. I'm in New York City on the Lenape land. I'm so happy to be joining all these folks who I admire so much for this conversation. Um, you mentioned already that my organizing is mostly focused on ending criminalization and transforming violence. And as part of that work, I've been engaged in mutual aid work for a long time in various contexts and different kinds of ways. Um, for today, I just want to use my five minutes to focus on two buckets of questions that I have. Um, that I'm engaging right now in this moment. One set of questions is at 40,000 feet and the other set of questions is closer to hand. Um, so my 40,000 feet questions that I'm thinking about right now is what, um, what's already been and what is currently being created in this moment. I'm in New York City, as I mentioned, which is and has been the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic in the United States. And in just the past 10 weeks, um, 90 mutual aid groups and over 550 resource groups in New York City have registered with a new formation that's called Mutual Aid NYC. Um, People can find out more about Mutual Aid NYC by going to their website, which is mutualaid.nyc. The fact that so many groups have emerged in such a short time and that so many groups who may already have existed are now leveraging up is remarkable. It's hopeful. But I think for the folks who are involved in the work, it's also incredibly challenging. Um, we don't have that much visibility in this moment. We're all in our local spaces, sheltering in place or in other kinds of um, imposed uh, distance from each other. And so we have even less visibility than usual. And I think in a way it's really fruitful and useful that we don't know really what's being built because there's so much happening. But on the other hand, that's also a potential concern and just the fact that it's hard to figure out how to bring groups in conversation with each other to support each other right now. Um, the second set of questions are the ones that I always have, which is about the state and its place and its role right now. Is it to be ignored? Is that even possible? Are we supposed to be confronting it or are we dismantling it within the mutual aid uh, you know, sphere and spaces that we're inhabiting. I have a question about what our current conditions are within this system and within our communities. We know that as organizers, conditions shape organizing, or at least they should. So what are the current conditions um, that are going to shape current organizing? We really need to be finding new modes of organizing that have purchase for our people and for ourselves in this current moment, given current conditions. I'm kind of tired of bringing up old models of things 
that were useful for the time that they existed within the conditions that they existed in. But I, I really am very um, kind of skeptical of, you know, uh, that old models necessarily hold up as the thing that we need in this current moment. I think it's always good to look to the past um, so that we can ask better questions of the present, but to look to the past because we think we're going to like superimpose what happened then to the current moment just feels defeating um, to me. Uh, the second set of bucket of questions for me are the questions that are close at hand. So I'm thinking a lot about the how of things, the how of things. Um, it's exceedingly challenging to be working on meeting people's in immediate needs while also engaging in consistent political education, while also developing leaders, while also building internal cultures of accountability and building healthy responses to conflict, as Dean already mentioned, to be doing all of these things simultaneously within a pandemic. Um, it's just a lot to be asking and can how can all these things be done and held effectively when a lot of people who have been coming into these mutual aid projects are newly mobilized people, newly politically engaged people? What are the resources that exist? How do those resources get to the folks? Uh, what are the new ones that are needed to be built, right? Um, again, what are the good models for our present conditions? How do we figure that out? So I'm just really sitting right now with a set of many questions um, and trying to help groups who reach out to me in particular around the issue of conflicts that are emerging already in many, many of these newly formed uh, formations. Um, how are we going to actually provide people the resources they need to be able to work their way through these conflicts? Otherwise, these groups will not exist for long. And I, while I'm a proponent of organizations dying, um, I think it's totally good for organizations to rise and then fall. That's, you know, it's, they're dynamic. They should be dynamic. Um, I do worry that uh, just the inability to have strong internal cultures built and strong community built is going to doom some of these efforts before they've even gotten a chance to get off the ground. So that's, that's a little bit of what I'm thinking about. That's uh, that's all really important stuff. I mean, it's like as as a uh, as I was listening to you talk, I was just imagining. Oh my god! I thought I thought I thought of all the like uh, dip, like so many things about this virus are just so uh, you know beyond us, and uh, we are totally flying blind. And so it's just really great to hear someone say, "Hey." We can't necessarily look to the past like global capitalism has never looked like this we've never been through like a global <coughs> pandemic all at once in in, in in this interconnected globalist world that we're globalized world that we're living in um and yeah how how will um these new people coming in into this who have had very little experience with activism i just think back to you know when you're first getting involved in activism all the all the drama and just how quickly people burn out. Um, well, I'm I'm wondering to the to other people on this call if anyone wants to respond to any of what um, Miriam Kaba raised. I feel like there's a lot of great stuff there. If anyone wants to jump in and uh, address some of the stuff that that she just said, and if not, we can move on to other questions. Okay. All right. Well, does anybody? Um, I always please, just raise my hand. Yeah. yeah. Please, yes. Well, I, I just wanted to respond um, and just um, support that point regarding strategy because the state really appears very willing to offload services that mutual aid groups are providing. So, what does mutual defense and offense look like? And these are definitely discussions that we need to be looking at and building out, like, or staging and preparing for what we can expect and also looking at ways we can shape through our planning, through our organizing um, and intervening uh, in these systems uh, on, on multiple levels. So I, I think it's an important thing to be thinking about on a broad base right now. Okay, does anyone else have anything else they'd like to add to that? 
Okay, so one of the, the main questions Dean, I have. Dean yeah? Had their hand up. <laughs> oh, who, I go, oh, had my thanks. Do you want to talk, Polly? No, go on. Sorry, this, sorry, y'all. I've never used Zoom before. I'm a terrible person. Keep <laughs> up in there. You're not a terrible person. Um, yeah, I just, I, one thing I keep seeing that I just think would be interesting to talk about in this group is um, I keep seeing the frame, you know, mutual aid is, ha is having a moment. A lot of people are using that term for the first time. A lot of people are joining groups and there's new levels of media coverage that use that term and that talk about mutual aid. I mean, that happens often during disasters, but disasters are frequently in one region or one um, city or location. And so I think there's like a thing happening. And what I'm noticing is a tendency to assume that the only goal of mutual aid is to get the government to do what mutual aid groups are doing. And I think that's a really complicated, interesting question for us. So it's like, um, in my, if I were to look at like, histories I've studied of the histories of like the United States government doing different forms of like poor relief, like welfare or like unemployment benefits or anything that's supposed to benefit workers. Usually when there's a crisis of increased mobilization and increased crisis for poor people where they might start to threaten the systems that are, um, then the relief will expand. And as soon as the uh, crisis is gone, the relief will contract. So oftentimes when the government like the government will start to co-opt or copy something that mutual aid groups have been providing. And maybe on some levels, the government like, can kind of provide it to more people sometimes. But as soon as they can, they'll like get rid of it. And the way they'll provide it will always be racist, will always exclude indigenous people, will always exclude undocumented people, people with you know, felony convictions, whoever it is. Like they, they, uh, uh, the government's version, as we see with like the stimulus bill, like who gets these unemployment checks, who gets the stimulus checks, and who doesn't, right? And so for me, it's not satisfying to say personally that my goal in us having a robust network of mutual aid is that we're hoping the government will replace mutual aid. I think that's probably obvious that that's what I would think, but I really hear that a lot in the current framings people are using around what the point of mutual aid is. It's like the government's failing, so we're going to fill in and force them to do it. And my perspective is that the government is actually totally succeeding at its goals, right? Which are black death, which are abandoned and poor people, you know, all the things that we've all been describing. Um, it's succeeding at that. It, create, it creates these forms of vulnerability and crisis, and then it doesn't mind disasters because it's a chance to close the border or get whatever other right-wing fantasies through. And the real question is, how can we use the rupture created by disaster, where suddenly a lot of people can't pay rent and are like, wait, rent's fucked up, you know? Where do we, how do we use these moments of rupture where more people are mobilizable, where more people are um, naturally getting together because people are naturally connective and naturally share, um, and, and have that actually have us practicing practices of uh, creating new social relations where we, where we provide for each other the things we essentially need with the, with the vision, with the dream, my dream. Um, for me, that's like, I imagine us, and I think this relates a lot to some of the things that Cooperation Jackson is, is, is saying and seeing and doing. And like, I imagine us having food systems run by the people who eat in them and work in them and transportation systems and energy systems and all the other systems that are actually um, co-governed by the people impacted by them and using them and, um, and, not, and there being nobody who's on top extracting from everybody, right? Um, but I guess I just think like this is actually a really a, a big kind of hot topic right now, like the relation, just as, as Mariam raised, the relationship between what mutual aid groups are trying to do and what it has to do with what we're, we do or don't want the state to do, especially because the government is going to keep giving some concessions while we are mobilized, like the unemployment checks are concessions and the stimulus checks concession, you know, or the pause on student loans is a concession or whatever. And they will only give those to the extent that we are mobilized and a threat um, and they will stop as soon as we are not. Um, and things will go back to being often worse than they were. I was just reading recently that a lot of like the FEMA um, disaster relief during Sandy was actually like loans that people had to pay back. Like, you know, that actually created debt. Um, so anyway, I, I'm just thinking about that relationship to the state and I'm wondering if other people are seeing that kind of limited framing emerge um, that makes me think that we need more robust conversations about the failures of the government to ever provide um, relief that isn't racist and um, colonial and all the things that we know it is. Um, does I can, else... just to... No, please go. If I can, Tim, I think... Yeah, please. I think we would be missing the point, y'all, if we didn't really try to push, you know, folks towards envisioning a new participatory society. You know, um, 
at least from, from my vantage point, I think our collective vantage point, uh, we're not trying to make, you know, the government more efficient. You know, um, not giving its history and relationship to us. That's not an aim and objective. And that's something we're trying to make folks, you know, uh, uh, aware of. And so the broader aim and objective, I think from our vantage point, what we're trying to push is, you know, we, as Dean was saying, we should be governing our own affairs broadly and democratically with those who we are in direct relationship with, you know, and those who have needs uh, that we know cannot and will not be addressed uh, either by the state nor by, you know, the capitalist system that, that it enables and that it, it props up. Like, let's envision a different piece. And this is an opportunity, I think, to really uh, push on that and to challenge ourselves and to challenge others, I think, to step into a new moment of vision. I understand some of the impulse of, you know, within uncertainty, a lot of people want something that, they, that they're familiar with and, you know, want to go back to, even though even it may have been extremely fucked up, excuse my language, you know, that some folks might want to head back in that direction. But number one, you know, the, while we are learning, capital is learning. And things are not going to go back the way that they were. There is too much an advantage that they have um, that they are playing to the hilt. I mean, Trump just eliminated all the environmental protections. So goodbye, clean air, water, you know, soil. That's gone, and that's an objective they've been trying to pursue for the longest period of time. You know, protections at your workplace or will therefore be eliminated and gone. Um, you know, they're, they're going to try to make as many of us kind of what gig workers or contract workers as possible from the reorganization in the grand experiment that this is, you know, Zoom being one of the key instruments of, of this experiment of how do you reorganize folks and get them used to accustomed to working more hours uh, without the overhead that capital has to, to put out to provide, you know, as concessions, health care, which many millions of people have not lost from losing their employment. Um, they also eliminate other forms of overhead, like, you know, these algorithmic companies that are, are, are sprung up, like, uh, um, um, what is this, uh, what, uh, Uber and all the rest of these folks, uh, you know, setting new terms and new conditions. Um, we have to, I think, really lead with our alternate vision. Not that it's all the same and nor that, it's, does, that it have to be. Uh, but uh, uh, I think the broader piece, which provides us greater self-determination and social liberation, which I think we encapsulate, you know, in a, in a totality, we need to be pushing, I think, broadly and boldly uh, uh, in this time, uh, because the alter alternative is worse than what we know. For sure. I mean, one of the things that has really blown me away is just how it's exacerbating, you know, uh, things that are already happening, fault lines that are already existing in our society and like really, um, you know, making everything worse. But at the same time, it's accelerating certain trends, like trends towards automation, trends towards alienation, trends towards all these things. And so I was really uh, struck by um, what Miriam said about like like analyzing these currents and looking at it from this strategic point and what i really like hearing is like pretty much everyone on this call is thinking about revolution and a lot of the people who are engaged in mutual aid are asking that question of revolution um and so i guess i would like to hear from everyone here um about how they feel like how what are some thoughts on how do we go from mutual aid to building you know, revolutionary power for resistance or however, however you look at that in your um, analysis. So, yeah, that's what I'd be curious to hear from people here. How, what are some concrete steps that we can take in our mutual aid projects to um, build for the long term so that we can start to build these autonomous power all over the, all over the world in the wake of this disaster? Does anyone have a answer? 
Klee. <laughs> yeah, I'll dig. I'll dig right in, and I'll extend this to like um, part of the conversation that we were just having, because um, I think we can be a lot more creative and deep than doing mutual aid while making demands of the state right now. Um, mutual aid is not just about radical re redistribution of resources; it's about radical redistribution of power. And for indigenous peoples, that means power to restore our lifeways, heal our communities and the land. And that's where we get our power from. So our mutual aid extends to the land and non-human beings. I, I take issue with them. A lot of the, the proposals um, for left uh, um, uh, like power struggles and revolution, uh, because I'm not interested in um, overthrowing one system to impose another. Um, I'm interested in liberation of the land because that's where um, our governance flows from as indigenous anarchists. No law can be uh, above nature. Um, and so, you know, settler and resource colonialism and capitalism have been and continue to be the crisis that has dispossessed indigenous peoples throughout the world of our very means of survival. Uh, this is nothing new. So if we are to have true solidarity and not charity on stolen lands, we must establish reciprocal terms that have a deep understanding of those legacies. Uh, so, you know, we have resisted attacks on Mother Earth as long as we have, um, and, and we have held that the balance uh, and harmony of creation is in, intrinsically and tied to our well-being uh, and the health and well-being of all living beings. Um, so our, immu our immune systems aren't compromised um, by accident. It's due to the imposition of colonial diets uh, and ecocide. You know, we are surrounded by abandoned uranium mines here. We are surrounded by coal mines here and coal-fired power plants. We are at the ground zero for uh, ecological crises. And for us, you know, global warming is, is a, it's a consequence of the war against Mother Earth and the imbalance that we have as um, human people. And so, in the Southwest, if you've ever been here, you, we grow up, you know, in, in this environment of ruins. Tourists drive by and they take pictures of these ruins. Um, you know, an anti-colonial and anti-capitalist world actually already exists. It has existed before and it continues to exist and thrive amongst those ruins. Um, you know, I think one of the understandings is that, and I think this is really critical in terms of revolution or liberation, is, is that the colonial and capitalist paths um, the logic is linear. Um, it, there's a beginning, there's a middle, and the end. Um, so if that path of greed, domination, exploitation, competition doesn't accept that it's reached its dead end, then we have to make sure of it. Indigenous concepts and understandings, um, our cosmologies are cyclical. We've been through cycles before. Again, this isn't the first uh, virus we faced, and we've faced biological uh, warfare against our people with viruses in the past, but we have fought back. We have resisted. We have constantly resisted. We're not just victims of resource colonialism. We have fought to in ensure that our air is clean, the land is clean, the water is clean. Um, but now we see the way that this system has designed uh, itself in a way that has put the Navajo Nation, our peoples, um, at great risk and in, in our lives at further jeopardy because of um, uh, the way that COVID-19 impacts us as a respiratory issue and because of the pollution that exists um, throughout our environment. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I'm not interested in salvaging the heteropatriarchal white supremacist capitalist colonial social order. Um, I think that mutual aid, um, it should not be exclusive. It should be decentralized. It should embrace diversity of tactics, you know, as any form of direct action. Um, you know, there's a lot of this sense of normalcy that people look forward to returning to. And I don't think anybody on this call um, or this, this, this discussion is interested um, in that. Um, but, you know, if settlers really mean those land acknowledgements that you're putting out there, then now is a critical time to honor indigenous peoples by disrupting power relationships and unsettling or attacking infrastructure while it's at its weakest point. You know, we can empower, stabilize, proliferate anti-colonial, anti-capitalist organizing, uh, connect radical mutual aid networks into to regional networks uh, and direct as many resources into those efforts as possible. So we empower them and we help propel them forward. Uh, this is a time, this is a critical time to fight, intervene, and sabotage in resource colonialism and ecocide. Uh, you know, this is a great moment for lone wolf actions. Um, you know, because we, at the end of the day, we can talk all we want about bringing our people and each other up, but how far are we going to actually get if we're not organizing to tear the system down? Amen. Amen. Um, Amen. We, 
<laughs> I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge that because there's this missionizing underlying element yeah. of like even charity work is so missionized these days. So I'm just, just uh, saying. God, no, you got me. It's, uh, it's, it's childhood never gets beaten out of me. Um, so yeah. Whoops. Um, Miriam, um, did you have something you'd like to add? Yes. Um, just uplifting everything that I heard. Um, and I just want to add, again, I want to go back to the how of things because I, I just know how it is to talk to friends, family members, folks who are not engaged to, they, there's no, there's no kind of path for folks that feels easy enough for them to engage in some of what we're talking about to get to the point where they're consciousness is raised to the level where they'd be willing to take further risk. And I, I'm just still struggling constantly with like what our containers are for this, how we reach people for real, how folks can access information. Uh, it's just, it's the, you know, I, I'm a I'm hundred percent a proponent of the fact that struggle is what produces politics, that you actually have to be engaged and be, you know, working with others, um, you know, in order for that to make any sort of real sense. And I also just know there's a, there's something missing that we don't have right now that is allowing enough people to get into these spaces so that the struggle can produce the politics that we want. And so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm maybe people who are listening to this have ideas or are doing things that we should be learning from um, that we could elevate so that more people can adapt and, and join and be part of and kind of create their own thing in their own communities. I'm not advocating for centralized struggle. I'm not. I'm, I know we, it has to be decentralized, but I think even at the decentralized level, people don't have ways in and they don't, we don't have enough organization. We just don't have enough containers for folks to do the level of work that we want to be doing because the state is very strong, even though the state has its cracks all the time that people can exploit. Um, and I, I just, yeah. So I'm, this is what is the consistent struggle for me is the how of all this stuff that we want to share and the how being a way that also makes sure that folks can stay together in the fight. Because that's what I'm seeing is just a lot of not being able to hold things together constantly. And yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering, does anyone um, who's who's been doing some of this work have anything that um, they'd like to add to what uh, Miriam just said? Uh, Dean? Then Callie. I just want to uh, pick up on something that Clea and Miriam both mentioned, which I just, because I, I have conversations with people about this a lot, and I think it's really useful to be explicit about what we mean by decentralized. What I've found is people, I've, I've talked to people who are like, it's so cool, these people are doing grocery delivery in this neighborhood, and these people, like, all these mutual aid things are popping up. And when they, they're like, but how do we bring it to scale? That's a question people often ask. And I think when they say that, they often are imagining it'll become like a single national organization with a centralized governance because that's the model of nonprofits, right? It's like the, the more you have like chapters but are one central sort of making instead of autonomous connected, right? That's that's considered scale. I just want to I just want to lift up and be explicit and if because that what I mean by um, proliferating mutual aid is to have there be more and more and more groups that might be doing things really differently, which is actually really amazing because we're in different communities that have different values, different strengths, speak different languages, have different cultural norms, can do things well differently. In disaster, local knowledge is always the most useful knowledge, right? And so, um, and that those, as Clay was saying, are actually networked in a meaningful way so that we can actually have each other's backs and stand up in each other's struggles. Like that to me is the kind of power I'm thinking about. Um, and especially because there's just so many more brutally horrible disasters coming as I think we've all been alluding to. One thing I just wanted to raise, I, I, I just read this really interesting article in the Atlantic about, um, about like the response in Hong Kong to um, COVID-19. I don't know if other people saw this, but basically it was about how, because there's already been so much um, mobilization in the anti-government movement in Hong Kong over the last 
six months, year, that, that mobilization led the people's movement to be able to do what the government was feeling to the government, like, you know, banned masks and doing all the bad things that many governments are doing about not responding to the pandemic. And the people in the movement like went around and put like hand sanitizing stations all throughout all the tenement apartments and hand out masks everywhere. And Hong Kong actually has had a much less severe um, level of infection than many other countries, even though the government failed, the people did it. And I just thought it was a really interesting account for us to try to imagine what scale of our mobilization can look like, including in a disaster like a pandemic. And that it was, and people all, so there were people were doing things like handing out masks and hand sanitizer and keeping all the sanitizer filled and making all these electronic maps where you could find hand sanitizer in the city and all of this stuff. But they also did things like um, when the, uh, when, when Carrie Lambs wouldn't close the border, the land border with China, people planted explosive, explosives at the border. Like people also raised the stakes and took bold action saying no to plans um, that the government made or when they try, when the government tried to open quarantine centers in a very densely populated area, people um, threw Molotov cocktails inside those spaces and prevented them from being open so that instead the government had to open them somewhere that would be less dangerous to everybody. Right? So I just thought it was an interesting thing to, for us to imagine also the connection, the relationship between mutual aid projects that do things like masks and groceries and bold tactics um, against the government, like how, how movements um, cultivate um, people's analysis such that some people either do those tactics or the people don't sell those people out or don't um, marginalize them or support their criminalization if they do, right? How do we see that cultural shift, which I think we, there's been moments, many moments in US history that I've heard about where movements have had that combination of um, widespread mutual aid happening and support for bold tactics. Um, and so I'm just kind of curious about that. And I think Miriam's question is a really, this is the one that keeps me up at night. It's like, why is it so hard for us all to hold it together? How is conflict um, really rip apart a lot of our groups and, and push a lot of people out of mobilization? And why are there, why is it so hard for people to get to get into organizations and spaces where they can break their isolation and, and be mobilized? Like what are the kinds of, and I think there's some classic stuff on the left that's problematic. Like we're really, we're really addicted to our jargon. We create barriers to people, to people joining. We don't create welcoming cultures sometimes in our orgs. Um, and there's like the actual culture of demobilization we live in, which is, you know, no joke. Um, but I, I really, I think Miriam's question is, is a central question for all of us. Um, Callie, you had your hand up as well. Yeah, I, I want to build on that and not be like a downer, but I think just building on, on a realism is, is the extent to which, and I'm going to try to fix the, the, the lighting. I miscalculated that. I thought it was going to be a little bit lighter uh, out here a little bit longer tonight. Um, uh, so give me a second to try to figure that out. But um, I think we also have to recognize the degree to which, particularly the last 40 plus years, um, I think the, the 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 most critical success of what you want, I mean, I'll call it the neoliberal project. I don't like that some terms, but I think it it's, may summarize it in, in a common way. Uh, I think its greatest impact was not just kind of, you know, uh, cannibalizing certain aspects of the state, you know, and, and making certain functions private. I think its deeper impact is what it did on a cultural and social level, at reprogramming uh, uh, us um, in, to a large degree, um, breaking down the social solidarity that many communities had, particularly in some of the major urban uh, settings, you know, uh, we're, we're talking about it, uh, you know, um, the institutions, the, the cultural norms, um, either good or bad, uh, that existed in say a lot of the, the black communities that emerged from the South, like the levels of solidarity uh, that once existed have been pretty much eviscerated, you know, to a large degree. So pulling on uh, certain common traditions and notions to do a level of mobilizing has, has a diminishing set of returns. And that is something I think we just need to be real about and that there's a new type of culture that we don't know yet. It's, it's I think, emerging. I think the large part of some of the, uh, the pushback in the struggle, you know, uh, coming from the movement for Black Lives, uh, challenging patriarchal relations within the Black community that have long been there, whether adopted or something we, we had brought with us, you know, uh, 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 you know before the, the period of enslavement. Um, you know, with some real barriers uh, within our movement, within our communities and something that was challenged. 
within that challenge, I think there's there's been some voids of people trying to figure out, you know, how do you construct new norms? How do you construct new solidarities? That's going to take us some time, I think, you know, uh, to figure out and, and construct something new. But I think the reality uh, of the situation is um, we have to recognize some of the gains of our opposition in our own social reality. Um, and I know I, you know, I, I see it confronted and it's kind of the how, you know, we've been operating on, on a theory that uh, we could try to, you know, in, encourage and push the mutual aid to combine with the, the uh, solidarity economy work that was already kind of emerging and development somewhat as a movement here in the United States very early, but also try to combine that with some of the more traditional forms of labor organizing, either in the trade unions or the workers centers, whether, you know, their strengths and weaknesses, combine that and put for an escalation set of tactics uh, based upon not only us creating kind of new co-ops and things of that nature from the solidarity economy side of things or the mutual aid side, but really starting to encourage and, and move folks on the more trade union side to start thinking about what the lessons were from like Argentina from 2000, 2001, where there were massive occupations of, of, of factories um, that workers seized and started to, to re-articulate. We need to start thinking, in my view, on that level, but it does get down to the question of how do we encourage more folks to take more risk? I see us at this, this phase, honestly, comrades, I think this next couple of months, we are kind of planting seeds. I think for when the next phase hits, which is going to be larger and even more devastating than, than this one. Um, you know, because of the very strategic uh, and deliberate uh, program of genocide that Trump and his, his enablers are, are, and allies are fully committed to. I mean, he said earlier today that even if, if there is a second wave, it's not like the first wave stopped already, right? But even if there is a second wave, they're not going to shut anything down. And I think we need to take that and, and the piece that he did with the EPA a couple of days ago, honestly, for what it is, that's a declaration of war against us. And so we have to start thinking, how are we going to step up uh, our cre creativity and our fight back resistance? And what level of risk are we going to take? These are some honest questions I want to put in addition to those, you know, that Clee, Dean, Miriam, if pushed it, I think we really need to look at ourselves, look at our comrades, you know, and, and have these real conversations in our communities without the fear that kind of got engendered uh, as a practice after September 11th, you know, because that changed some of the political dialogue and relationships that many of us had. We changed our language to try to fight against the censor. I think that's another thing that we need to recognize so we have a more open set of conversations about what it's going to take to get out of this particular dynamic and situation. For sure. Um... Does anyone else have anything else to add to that? Okay. Um, well, we we have a whole bunch of questions from YouTube. Might as well take a look at some of these. Um, this is this is a good one. Um, this is from Susan Jones on YouTube. Um, how do we resolve conflicts and build solidarity? I mean, we've seen. I mean, yeah. But well, okay, how do we do it? Oh my goodness. I mean, isn't that what we've been, that's really what we've been talking about is the difficulty of doing that work across our communities, let alone just within the communities we identify with. But I do think it's possible to do. There are so many resources that exist out there. My question is always, how are people going to access those resources so that they can actually do the work they need to do internally and then across communities um, to address what is normal? Conflict is normal. Like, I just love, I, I want people to understand that you're always going to be in conflict with people because we're always going to have disagreements. We're not uniform across the board monoliths. So, we have to just know conflicts are going to exist. The problem is, for me, as I see it, is the fact that we don't know how we have terrible communication skills. No one actually teaches anybody how to talk with each other in ways that would allow would, would allow people to hear you. We have very little kind of, um, and again, there are no places where that happens. Think about the way that you grew up in your family. Sometimes in families, 
there are very damaging patterns of communication within families that people then take into movement space. And they can't, it's not anybody's fault. It's this is the culture that we're breeding and that we live in and that we grow up in and that we then replicate. But I think if people could see conflict as generative, if people could come up with ways to learn the basics of communication and of listening and of hearing, and then also of sometimes just disagreeing because we're not gonna actually agree and still be able to work together. If we can't do those very basic things, I don't, I just don't know where, how we're gonna be able to really move in solidarity with each other in meaningful ways that allow us to weather, the, the state is coming after us all the time. I think what Kali said about the declaration of war, this is absolutely the case, but war making and, and this state has been the case for folks from, you know, <laughs> you know, Klee mentioned from the beginning of, you know, of, of settler colonialism here in the U.S. So people need to get ready for this. We need to disseminate resources. We need people who know how to transform conflict to step up and, you know, come into groups and support groups to work their way through that, create their own cultures that meet their needs and that they be able to do this. But it's a practice and it's a structural thing. And you have to keep doing it. And a lot of people just don't want to do the work. I mean, it, we just have to be honest about that too. A lot of people are conflict averse for lots of good reasons, but they just don't want to do it. They just would rather ignore it, push it aside, pretend it's not happening, um, be super toxic, whatever the situation is. We have to do this work. That's really, I mean, there's just nothing else for me to say except that. And I keep saying it over and over again. And I don't think people are really taking it to heart as much as they ought to, but we are seeing the results, which are not good. Um, Clee, did you have something you'd like to add? I'll try to make it quick. Um, yeah, on an interpersonal level, I think transformative and restorative justice, like we have cultural frameworks for that. And there's a lot of really amazing groups that are working on that, especially in terms of collective care. Um, but on an organizational level and political and movement based level, I think certain conflicts shouldn't be resolved. I think we should actually precipitate it, precipitate conflict. I, I like agitation, provocation and interventions. There's this sort of like false sense of an assumed unity that everybody should flatten out, um, uh, you know, in organizing. And that's part of the reason that I, um, wrote and published accomplices, not allies is to stimulate the provocation and agitate as much as possible that certain conflicts should not, certain power relationships and the underlying ones that exist and are perpetuated, especially with allyship. Um, I don't want a solidarity with that. Um, so let's actually talk about what we mean by solidarity, whose terms the solidarity is on and what the conditions are. Um, and in and, and interpersonal level, again, it's different, but organizationally and politically, I think that that's where we need to be at. It's awesome. Um, yeah, uh, accomplices, not allies is, is great. I wasn't aware that you wrote that. Great. Go ahead, text. Dean. It looks like Dean's trying to get in. Uh, Dean, what's up? Thank you. Yeah, I just want to say like something about what you just said, Clee, and what Miriam was saying just made me really feel like uh, I just want to name that like part of what it is is we're supposed to be pacified, like on a deep level. And so if you if you're supposed to be pacified, then conflict is threatening, right? And there's this image that I'm a successful and good person. If no one's ever mad at me and I'm not ever mad at anyone, this kind of like fearfulness, I think is really central, especially to white culture. But it's also a lot about a particular kind of white masculinity of um, being really fragile um, and being afraid of having any conflict. And I think, you know, I just want to back up what Miriam was saying. Like, if we do work, we care about with other people. If we do anything we care about with other people, we will have conflict. Like, it's a, it's a sign that we care. It's like a part of being invested in it um, and I'll just say that like one of the things I've been really focused on and part of what I'm putting in this book about mutual aid that I'm writing for Verso is like a, a real focus on what are some of the most common conflicts that groups run into like you run into conflict around money you run a conflict around people having unethical sexual behavior you know you run into conflict around people somebody want to get famous for the work you run into con conflict because there was somebody who kind of started it and they feel like they own it but they're making decisions but everybody else has to do them we can guess, we can, it's like, it, they're patterns, right? And so to some degree, we can also put things in place in our groups if we take time to care about the inside of the group and not just what the group looks like on the outside, which is hard in internet culture. If we actually care about what's on the inside, we can 
put things in place like, hey, what are what kind of culture do we want to have? We can have those conversations. What do we want it to feel like when people come into the group? How do we want it to be welcoming? You know, what is what are some cultural norms we're following right now that maybe relate to like the way the people who we who founded it act? And are, are they working for us? You know, like just even having those conversations and and what do we think about decisions? Like is a decision, you know, can anyone just make a decision that we're going to like add a new grocery route or like add a new location for our services or whatever we're doing? Or, or do we actually get together in some particular way where we talk about that? Or how do we facilitate meetings? Like this stuff is so, I think for some people who are really experienced activists, this stuff is old hat, but also I think there's tons of groups that I run into that are like 25 years old and they still don't have a way they make decisions, right? It's easy for us to, to not set up the internal infrastructure and that can actually produce um, more conflict than is needed and instead of having conflict energy go to the spots where it's really important like we really want to debate certain things we really want to um uh we want to rub up against those places we're going to rub up those, against those places where i'm acting the way i acted in my family and it's not working with the group you know um but i think that there's uh you know, I think there's two pieces to this. There's like, how can our groups anticipate conflict and actually put things in place to care for one another so that we don't get taken down by all the same stuff everybody gets always taken down by? And also, how do we, like if we, if we knew that eventually people inside our group are going to sexually assault each other, what would we put in place ahead of time um, so that we would try to prevent that and also actually be responsive to it instead of denying it later, which is what a lot of groups do, right? Um, and then also there's just this fundamental piece where like, Ideally, we all enter movements and we enter organizations and we're doing some of our own personal healing because we've all been raised in these horrid cultures and these violent families and these shitty institutions. And so we have to have some kind of commitment to that healing, which means a commitment to like non-defensiveness, to actually change, to be changed by people we're working with and to be challenged and get and receive feedback that the way that we participate is maybe not working for somebody or is harmful or is too much or too little or people want to hear from us more or whatever and i think that um that's that's what i hear partly and and miriam in, in your challenge to us all at least that's what I, how it lands for me is like can we be willing to be transformed by the work so that we can become the kinds of people who could co-govern our lives and that means we've got to shed a lot of layers of stuff that is trauma intergenerational trauma and trauma for our own lives and just training on numbing out and not and being pacified and move towards um, towards like what's hard about healing. Healing is painful, and it includes it's collective, and it's like it might include rubbing up against other people I love in this group. And I came into the group, and I, they were the, my favorite person. I was so inspired, and then you know, twenty days later, I hate them the most. Like all of those feelings are because of this this healing process. And I think that um, it, it's a lot. A lot of people just leave right when it's getting good, and there could have actually been a deeper level of transformation for the individuals and for the group and for those relationships and we really we just need that like you know it's, i think it's a basic thing i learned from women of color feminisms of different kinds is like relationships are movements are only made of relationships that's all they're made of so more attention there instead of the what the capitalist thing is is your movement is like how good your twitter looks or like how many groceries you delivered and your numbers it's all this external like optics that's really not um, it's not where it's at that's beautiful. Um, well, I, we're nearing the end of this, so um, before we, you know, go off our on our close our computers, um, like to hear just from everybody before we get out of here, a couple closing thoughts. Um, you know, in light of everything that's been said, if there's anything else that's still on your heart, or I'm sure this this conversation could probably last for four hours, but. Um, you know, any closing thoughts before we bounce out of here? Um, just a couple minutes per person would be great. Um, if anyone would like to speak and talk about, you know, what's what's on your mind? How, how are we going to close this out? Who wants to go first? Callie. So, yeah, look. Um, I'll just try to reiterate. I think... Uh, the worst um, is yet to come relative to COVID-19. Um, we need to start getting our communities uh, prepared, ourselves prepared, quite literally, I think mentally and spiritually uh, for what's coming. Uh, but let's recognize, I think, the opportunity that that is, is coming down the pipeline. Uh, we already see 
I would argue millions of folks who have been moved, who are doing new things, you know, um, this kind of spontaneous upsurge in, in mutual aid uh, has been a beautiful thing. Uh, and I think it's going to go, have its ups and downs, its ins and outs. Uh, but I think it's going to continue to grow as the needs grow. Uh, and I think forces like us that we are allied with um, should be doing the most that we can to kind of plant the seeds from our lessons. Not that we know how to do this any better than anybody else has, has done it, uh, but just share the reflections from our experiences, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, of what it takes to kind of move uh, this work forward that others can learn from it. And then let's do the hard work of building the, the connective tissue that we need uh, to really, I think, try to advance a broad, you know, degree of, of revolution and social transformation. You know, um, uh, at the very least, I think we can all agree uh, that capitalism, colonialism, you know, uh, the state patriarchy, these are things um, that they're, that are kind of, they ain't going to go anywhere on their own, but they're up for grabs in a, in a time like this. Uh, and we all have a contribution to make, to end these damn things. And I think there's a, a profound degree of opportunity ahead of us to learn how to do something new in the midst of this crisis. And many more people are going to be, you know, turned on as a necessity looking for answers, uh, and let's be humble and, and somewhat ready and receptive to the degree that we can. Um, to lay bare what we know so others can try to pick it up and improve upon it. That's awesome. I like, uh, I like thinking about it in terms of like, you know, learning what we can do together in this. Um, anyone else? Who wants to go next? Okay. Hi, um, I'll go, Miriam. Um, I just want to quickly just say to folks again, I, I'm really, really, really hopeful that more people who've developed resources that they think are useful to the world and to how we're going to actually be able to advance uh, idea of liberation within a context of um, overturning all that currently exists for something else, another world, another possibility. I want people to share their knowledge and to share their resources with other folks in their communities and beyond, because we, I know there are tools that people have made and are making. I know there are so many ways that people are doing things that they found useful and we don't need to be reinventing wheels. We can actually take from what we've learned. And I think just following up on what Kelly said, our lessons and all these things need to be further accessible so that all of us can learn from them and we don't have to keep inventing things over and over again um, in order to be able to support our work moving forward. So I'm just grateful to folks who make those resources and then make them available to other people. I want to keep pushing us to do more of that. That's awesome. Yeah, it's a huge question of um, just people being generous with their time and skills and just being patient. Um, Okay. I'll dive in. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess I just, I'm thinking about whether people, some people who are watching might be like just for the first time mobilizing, doing mutual aid for the first time in a project, um, you know, and feeling that, that energy, that urgency to support other people in your community um, and making those new connections. And I just want to say, like, I think one of the biggest dangers to our work is if we do that work in the same way that capitalism has told us to feel about work. It's like, how can we find another channel? So how can we stay plugged into that passion and that desire to be connected and to support and to be of service to fellow beings um, rather than getting lost in some of those ego trips and being right and being seen by everybody doing it or being the most important project in the neighborhood or like all that competitive stuff. I, it's like, I, I really feel like capitalism wants to rob us of our joy in all of our activities you know, whether it's like eating or having sex or going for a walk, like it wants to make it into something else, like be skinny or be the best at whatever, you know, like it's always trying to take that away from us. So it's like when we do, and this is why people burn out and are miserable sometimes I think in their, um, in their work as organizers or as activists um, in their community. So I just, I, I, I think it's useful to think of an image, like what is a joyful thing? Like I want 
this mutual aid project, even though it involves washing a lot of dishes or whatever, to be to, or changing diapers or sleeping, to feel like picking berries or to feel like swimming or to feel like spending time with my grandparent or like whatever, like tuning in because it is that, you know, and it's like capitalism has told us what's dirty work and what's clean work and what's hard and what's easy. And it's all about numbing us out and making us consumers and making us alienated when we're doing work for pay. And I guess I just want to encourage us all to like be, to, to notice how we feel while we're doing the work, while we're at that meeting, whatever, are we bored? Are we checked out? Are we judging others? Like, are we criticizing ourselves and full of shame? Just whatever, like just, it matters. It really matters what feeling states we cultivate while we do the work. And, and that really relates to how, how we'll be together and how, how strong our relationships can be. And the, the script we are giving is a bad script. So we need a lot of um, attention to the script in order to, um, to, to be a different way than we've been told to be. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Like uh, whatever affect theory, you know, just uh, how we feel when we're in a place and yeah, it's, it's how people experience things through their emotions. Um, very important. Um, Cleve, did you have any closing thoughts? Um, it's not a, it's an ongoing cycle and I look forward to more conversations about this. Um, uh, with indigenousaction.org, we published uh, this piece called Rethinking the Apocalypse, an Indigenous Anti-Futurist um, Manifesto. If you're interested, there's a lot of sort of like thoughts and ideas about where we're at. And um, this is sort of like echoing a bit of that. Um, because our prophecies have warned of the consequences for violating Mother Earth, we have these teachings and our ways of being have guided us through the endings of worlds before this is within our history it's within our bodies it's within our uh, cosmology and our understandings it's within our ceremonies and our prayers it's within our medicines uh, so as this sickness ravages these lands and we organize to take care of each other and heal each other and those most vulnerable uh, however we name that healing i think we must constantly ask ourselves will we continue to allow this empire to recuperate or these these ways these these monsters these sicknesses um colonialism and capitalism these sicknesses these plagues um and and i think this gets into what Miriam is saying is this like you know will we do that um and what can we do to ensure that it doesn't recuperate itself awesome um well you know i just really want to thank everyone for coming on here and sharing all your such a diverse range of opinions and the things that people are focused on it's like if uh, however they chose y'all to come on here y'all really complement each other really well as far as like subjects and topics and it's there's so much to think about in light of this conversation so really um <clears throat> thank you to y'all for taking the time to come on here and do this thank you to the all the people listening, all the people tuning in from home, watching live on YouTube. Shout out to the sponsors, PM Press, Verso, Haymarket, and A Radical Guide. And um, especially thank you to everyone who uh, donated money. We've raised about $3,400, and that will be split up equally between MAP for Youth, La, La, Resist La Resistencia, Cooperation Jackson, Indigenous Mutual Aid, and present a main. And if you want to donate now, you can Venmo to PM underscore press and we will add it in. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's clearly a lot of work to do. You know, some of the, I think one of the great themes from this call has been, or from this talk has been just that there's, there are openings now. It, you know, that we all feel kind of dark and bleak and, or at least I do, it's a really, like suffocating moment for a lot of people. And um, it's inspiring to hear what y'all are doing, what, what work my comrades are doing, the stuff we, we see. And uh, it's just so important to recognize that in this moment, you know, while the capitalists and the colonizers are getting, you know, ready to do what they're going to do. There are also just as many openings for us. Like the, the future is unwritten, but it's, the stakes are really high so good luck to everyone out there who's fighting and building and uh 
you know, doing the hard work and, you know, going out into the world with uh, joy and love and solidarity in their hearts and bravery. And uh, yeah. So <clears throat> again, to the, to the panelists, Dean, Callie, Clee, Miriam, thank y'all so much for what you had to say. It was really uh, inspiring and uh, rich. So good luck out there. And, uh, you know, may we all meet on the barricades or the food distribution depot, whichever it may be. Pleasure being with uh, all you comrades. Um, thank you for putting this together. Um, I, let's definitely continue um, and stay in contact with each other directly. You know, I, I think that's important. And, um, you know, my last shout out is join us on June 1st. You know, we, we're trying to get as many folks as possible to take another round of mass action, however that may look in your community. You know, but send a, a clear message first and foremost to our own folks that we can stand in solidarity with each other and, and you know, change things piece by piece.